so I want to talk about one of the most difficult parts of martial arts training, um, which I think is often not spoken about enough, which is the teacher-student relationship. Um, how a teacher is with a student, how a student is with a teacher, why it is complicated, and how to navigate that process as, as best as possible. I've I mean, obviously, I've encountered this relationship from two different perspectives. I've been the teacher relating to the student, and I've been the student relating to the teacher. And still, I, I actually, I have to manage both of those roles because of training with people and also then teaching other people. And it, it's complicated. It's a complicated relationship and one that takes a great deal of skill to navigate. <laughs> to navigate. And... I think that I think it should be explored. I think it should be explored because I think it's something that's taken for granted. And I think sometimes that when somebody starts to teach, say you've been in a Qigong class or a Tai Chi class or Kung Fu class, whatever, you know, for a while, you know, and you've risen through the ranks as it were and you've you've developed your skill and then you're given permission to, which is usually hopefully what happens, uh, you're given permission to teach or advise to or whatever and then you start a class. Now, I think what is often not given enough thought or enough discussion often for those people who are transitioning to, to teaching these arts is that obviously they're going to encounter the complexity of the teacher-student relationship themselves from the perspective of being a teacher, which carries a lot more responsibility than you might initially think. Now, after 20 years of teaching, um, which is next year, this year, something, I don't know, around there anyway. I've done that many years. I've done a lot of years of teaching, not including assistant instructor when I was younger and, and things like this. And all of my teaching has been with a, an overseer, if you like, of somebody who taught me. So, you know, but I've still taught a lot. I can't say that I've always managed this relationship perfectly myself in the same way that I messed up the teacher-student relationship when I was the student on occasion with the teacher and I navigated that process badly. I've also navigated, certainly in my early years of teaching, um, the role of the teacher to the student badly as well. So it, it, I've made many mistakes there, like many people have. But it's it's certainly something I've given a great deal of thought about. So also, I should say as well, I hope the sound comes out on this, right? Because it's an evening here in Bali and it's rainy season and we're actually in the middle of a thunderstorm. So hopefully this mic doesn't pick up <laughs> too much of the ambient rainfall around me. Um, but we'll see. I'm also dressed like a total slob so i apologize for that i normally make more effort for these podcasts but uh i've just finished training uh, so i just got training clothes on so uh yeah teacher student relationship it's it's a it's a complicated one and uh you know like often you'll see you'll see people writing about how to find you'll see these articles all the time don't you how to choose the best teacher and i think that many people probably myself at some stage has probably written one, I don't know, over the years on the internet. But you'll see most teachers at some stage have written how to find um, the best teacher or how to find a teacher, you know. And I've even sometimes seen people write articles on how to find a student. But uh, yeah, I often feel they're kind of negligible or sort of not that useful, I think, those articles, because generally all that happens is whoever writes the article or describe themselves. <laughs> it's like all of the, the things, well, a good teacher is this, a good teacher is that, a good teacher, oh, well, actually, that's me, you know. So th there's always a bias behind those things. But uh, the amount of articles I've seen of that, like how to choose a teacher, what I rarely see is how to, you know, the complexities of then dealing with that teacher. Once you've found that teacher, how do you then navigate the relationship with them? Because, of course, especially in the Chinese arts, it can be a little bit complicated. The first thing that you need to encounter, or first thing you will encounter as a student to the teacher is of course you're walking into a class or you're walking into a relationship with that person and you want to learn from them. And I'm, I'm, that is my assumption is that you are there to learn from that person. So this is from the perspective of the student. There's also then a difference culturally if you're walking in as a Westerner, say from my perspective, I can't really talk about being a someone in Eastern culture, but from Western culture, there's a difference in walking into a class with a Western teacher or walking into a class with an Asian teacher, a very, very different thing. And especially if you're in Asia, of course, and lots of my lots of my years of study were in the West, especially when I was younger, martial arts classes. And then as I got older, lots of my study was in the Far East and in Southeast Asia. So I went for this stage of having to suddenly navigate Asian culture because even the Asian teachers that I had when I was younger in the West had already adapted a little bit to being in the West. You know, they were sort of 
a halfway house between the two. But by the time I got to Asia, I had to navigate Asian culture, which means as much as anything, not just learning a language, which is what people normally point out, that at least some skills in that area are probably wise if they don't speak your language. But also there are cultural differences um, from walking into a class in the East as well. Although, like, to be honest, I think that I think that maybe those differences are less than you might think, other than maybe the presentation of them is not the same, because all teachers would expect a certain degree of respect for a start, and a certain degree of manners, and a certain degree of politeness, whether it's the East or the West, you know? And actually, like, uh, that makes me laugh, like, because if you're going to navigate the relationship between a teacher and a student, uh, from my perspective, I'm a student, and I want to train with that teacher. You know, like the first thing I always make sure is that I have manners, that I'm polite and that I'm respectful in my behavior towards that teacher, that towards that person. I'm also polite and respectful towards the members of the class when I'm walking into it, especially those people that have already been trained in their years. The seniors are essentially, whether we like it or not, going to be a kind of closed circle around that teacher. They're almost like the gatekeepers to get to that person. That's almost unavoidable. You, you can't... You can't pretend that there's never going to be some kind of clique to a certain extent. And some teachers are better than others at eroding that within a school. I personally don't like cliques, so I try to break them up a little bit. I want everyone to mix. But there's always going to be a little bit of that kind of taking place. So when you walk into a school as a student, you have to be polite and respectful and have good manners towards the seniors as well as towards the teacher. Now, that's always been like obvious to me. That's the first thing that I've managed whether in the east or whether in the west so especially uh, walking into a new class where there is a new teacher often i found that especially in martial arts not so much in qigong but in martial arts there's often a little bit of like tension with the teacher when somebody new is coming in because i guess that there's a side that they don't know if that person is challenging them which could turn physical of course but then also like egos or egos are a little bit more <laughs> fragile in the martial art world that we might like to believe, even with teachers, especially with, with teachers. I mean, the, all the arguing that takes place online between people that gets very venomous sometimes and very personal between Tai Chi teachers or martial arts teachers is often, it's only because of fragile egos, that's all it is. It's, it's just egos attacking each other. They might pretend that it's about something deeper, but it's not. It's fragile egos. So if that is there, then there's often a little bit of testiness at first anyway. And I, whether that's right or wrong, or you like to admit it, it's there. So as a student, I always made sure, well, I don't really want to rub that person up the wrong way straight away. I don't want to put their defenses up. So I would walk in and be very polite and very respectful and have good manners and present myself in a way that says, look, politely, I, I would like to come and see what you're doing and, and learn from you. To me, that's obvious, but it's amazing how many people fuck that up. Like now that I'm a teacher, I see that. The amount of people who just come in and are just instantly rude to you. And it's not even like it's an open challenge or something. They're just rude. They have no manners. They walk in. And I think this is very much, I see it more from Western students than I do from Asian because I have a lot of Asian students now. Times are changing. Asianers will learn off of Westerners, which is <laughs> something that I've seen change in my lifetime. But um, I've seen it a lot of Western students, especially of the Western Europe, English people, Dutch people, French people, like that side of Europe, you know, not over towards the East, Eastern Europe so much, but more over towards here and definitely in America as well, that there is people that will walk in and just give you a very fuck you attitude straight away as a student towards a teacher. Now, I get that quite a lot. And it's, and I think it's kind of insane because, uh, okay, someone will come in and the, the lack of manners they have is often the idea of, you owe me something. Like, I am buying something from you, so what are you going to give me? Almost as if you're buying something in a, in a shop. Like, they've turned up, they've paid the fee, they've bought, they, they have rights, I have to provide a service to them. As soon as you give that attitude, that is the wrong attitude for that teacher. Now, I'm not saying this because I want that to end, because I got so used to that that I'm okay to navigate that. I know that it's just a kind of level of entitlement that exists amongst, not all, but quite a lot of people these days, especially of younger people from my experience and this entitlement means they feel like they can turn up and be rude to the waiter like rude to the teacher and i will just go okay and then fine <laughs> politely ignore it and then teach them anyway but at the same time in my mind i know that that person needs to learn something else before they learn martial arts or before they learn qigong and one of the first thing they need to learn is manners and the very fact that they didn't learn that off of their 
parents or whatever, whoever was supposed to teach them when they're younger, it surprises me. But it's like as a teacher, like you can't help it, no matter how high-minded I could be and how acceptant I could be, there's already a rift created. You know, you've walked straight in and burnt your bridges right from the beginning. It's not because that teacher, I can only speak from my perspective, would feel threatened by that or particularly appalled by that, but it just shows to me that that person has such a lack of skill in their ability to interact. And it was also so self-centered that they would not consider how their interactions with other people that already, un I don't really think that you are a prime candidate for learning the martial arts to a high level. So, like I say, I'm not making this podcast to change the way people talk to me. Actually, I get on well with my students, and um, I, I, enjoy, I shouldn't say my students. That's a phrase I don't use. I get on well with the people I teach. I don't own anybody. I don't own any students. They're not mine. They're people that are coming in. So I get on well with the people I teach that are visiting my class for a period of time. But uh, I just... I see that bridge burned all the time. And I see that bridge burned sometimes when I'm with other teachers. I've been with my teachers and then other people have come in and I've seen them burn that bridge right at the beginning. They want to train with the person who's teaching me and they burn that bridge right from the beginning. So your first step is manners as a, as a student. Now the next thing obviously as a student, and I'm going to spend more time on the teacher because I think the teacher has a lot more responsibilities, but the next thing as a, as a student to understand is that once you've navigated manners and everything like this, you have this fine balance to walk, isn't it? Because realistically, as a student, you do want to get close to that teacher if you want to learn off them. So normally when I turn up, I've assessed the teacher for a while, I've stayed, and my assessment period for whether I wish to continue my studies with a teacher or not is normally between one and three months to be honest, because I don't willy-nilly just go anywhere. I, I normally pick, okay, I will go and check this person out because their reputation is good and I've heard good things and I want to see what they're doing. And then once I get there, once I've committed, I'll commit to a month, sometimes three months if I want to make absolute sure. But that is my test period. It's not one lesson because I think if you walk into a class, it can be an off class, it can be a particularly good class, it can be an off day for the teacher. You've been off day for you. There's so many variables that I would rather hang around a month to three months. So as a student, I would stay for one month or three months because that gives me time to get to know the teacher. I get to know the teacher. I would remain polite. But during that period of time, it off I get to see a little bit about how that teacher is over a period of time themselves with other people and with their life and things like this. And I think it's not perfect, but often in that kind of period of time, you can tell how they are emotionally, how they are maturity level wise, whether they're fair, whether they're cruel, whether they're vindictive. You can kind of see those things, especially if you don't just watch the interactions with yourself, but also their interactions with other people. Do they deal with the people they're dealing with well? If you have the good luck to see them in their personal life, do they deal with their personal life well? Because me personally, if I was going to a internal arts teacher, or a meditation teacher, a Qigong teacher, and, and also a martial arts teacher, to be honest, if they can't manage their own life well, and they're very subject to emotional swings, and they're very angry, they're very upset, they go home and have a cry at night, or they go home and have a rage at night, or, or they're unfair, or they're cruel, or they're childish, those are people I don't really want to train with, because I also recognize that one of the subconscious interactions that takes place between a teacher and a student of anything. It happens from your English teacher at school. It happens to your history teacher. It happens to your, if you go to an art, you know, to a, a football club, it goes, it happens in all these things, but it definitely happens in martial arts and Qigong to a very, very high level, possibly because of the energetics, possibly because of the intense nature of the chain, training, if there's combat involved, who knows? But there is a transference of the teacher's qualities to yourself, whether you like it or not. So if you, the teacher is very, very angry, say, very, very angry all the time. And then I am in that class, not stern, that's different, but angry. I mean, emotionally charged in a negative way. If I'm going to spend a lot of time in that class, realistically, it's going to seep into me. I'm going to pick up those character traits. And the weirdest things will pass across the board, you know, like you might have known that I've got odd tastes. You might be able to tell from the decoration of this podcast studio with some of you sending messages saying you like it and some of you are disgusted at my lack of taste and I agree with the second group wholeheartedly I get it if you could see the rest of this room that's off screen it would drive some of you insane but it's got a kind of coke den brothel 1980s Miami kind of vibe doesn't it but that's what I kind of like I like being I don't like coke dens or brothels particularly but I, I like that vibe that's what I like now funnily enough 
I've noticed that many of the people I teach start to veer towards that kind of style themselves. Poor people, I've destroyed their taste and I apologize. So even like stupid things like that pass across. It's the nature of something, especially if you're working with chi, if that's within your paradigm of reality, that kind of connection will pass those things across. So people are starting to buy, I don't know if that's on the camera, there's a little wooden pink flamingos over there, but if people are starting to buy flamingos, gold fucking bulldogs, to tastelessly ruin the style of their house with, then they're definitely going to be picking up my emotional state. They're going to be picking up my anger outbursts and my sadness and my paranoia. There's a big one for martial arts, isn't it? They're going to be picking up that if they spend a lot of time with me. And I recognize that. I'm a fairly strong individual. I'm not someone that's easily swayed. Peer pressure is not an issue for me. But at the same time, if I'm going to spend a lot of time around someone, I'm still going to pick that up. It's only the same as that old thing, isn't it? What's the number they give? Is it the five people you spend... I can't ask a question. There's no one here to answer it. Is it the, the five people you spend most time with influence you? Or you are made up of the five people you spend your time with? Or something like that. I'm sure you know the saying. Someone will write it underneath in the comments, I'm sure. That kind of idea. If you're influenced by your five friends, you're going to be influenced by the person that's teaching you. So while you might be picking up techniques and you might be picking up how to breathe, how to punch, depending on what you're doing, how to put a needle in if it's Chinese medicine, you're also going to be influenced by their mood and by their mindset. Now, one example of this is I spent um, a long time with one teacher because he was teaching Chinese medicine. Now, I was doing a degree and I didn't have a choice but to do this Chinese medicine degree. Well, I did. Of course, I, everyone has a choice. I'm responsible for my own decisions, but I needed to spend three years in one place to do this Chinese medicine degree when I was younger. Um, while I was learning it. Now, even that, no no energetics there. It was a very westernized version of acupuncture, actually, this particular course was. But the teacher was grumpy, vindictive, childish, bullying, kind of paranoid. He wasn't a particularly admirable person. So even, I don't mind saying that either, like nobody really respected him. It was funny, but he wasn't respected. And when learning with him, actually, I found that over that period of time, I became more childish, more vindictive, more like I started to see some of those traits coming up in me, only a little just there, you know, and I was very aware of it. And I'm plucking those <laughs> character traits out or whatever, but that pervasive quality from the person you're spending time with will pass across to you. And you have to be careful of that. So when I go to a see, see a teacher, I will stay a month, stay a couple of months, I get to know him. And if those kind of character traits are not something that I wish to have within me, I don't wish to operate in that way, I walk away from that teacher. I'm very um, discerning on that level. I don't mind harshness. I don't mind criticism from a teacher. I certainly don't mind being told what to do. Like, that's all okay. I don't mind if they joke a little bit and take the piss. I certainly do that. But I don't like emotional highs and lows, vindictive, bullying, paranoia, nasty, like all those things I don't really want in my realm of who I am. So therefore, I will, certainly as I got older and I became more aware of this, choose teachers that don't have those kind of character traits. I want someone who is open and sincere and dedicated, and ability to be very, very tough, but also ability to be very, very kind, ability to to manage their own life and their affairs and their relationship with people very well, disciplined at the right time, but also humorous at the right time. And with an underlying sense of love that pervades everything they do and, and fairness. And that's what I want from a teacher. Because aside from all the techniques I'm learning, I don't want to pick up those negative character traits. So therefore, as a student, I will watch and I will choose a teacher during that time. This has got me in trouble because, sort of political trouble, because to me, one to three months is enough time for me to check a teacher. Because once I've decided to be with a teacher, I'll stay with them forever if need be until such time as they feel that they have taught me to the best of their ability or they don't want to see me anymore <laughs> that's normally what happens or, or they die of old age that's the other thing so for example the teacher i've been with now i've been with a decade and, and the one before that was uh, there was a little gap when i was with some teachers for shorter periods then another one was eight years and then the one before that coming up to a decade as, as well and they overlapped a little bit with each other so i've had long relationships with these teachers a lot of time spent with them so, but, but from the teacher's perspective, three months is often what they see as a full commitment. So often I've got to the end of one month or three months, spent some time with them and then gone, no, I don't want to spend time with these people. And then very politely separated myself from that position. Now, here's where the complexity of the teacher-student relationship comes in, because during that one to three months, I've often remained a little standoffish, polite, friendly, dedicated to their practice, tried their methods, but also stayed a little distance because I don't want to build 
that kind of um, attachment from their perspective that's complicated. But sometimes they see three months as, okay, they are now my teacher, so which is not how I see it. So then when I have extracted myself from that situation, it's caused problems. It's almost caused a kind of abandonment issue within that, that teacher, which normally causes that teacher to become very venomous or something. And I think that's very unfortunate. It's actually happened with a couple of well-known teachers that I've gone to stay with for a little while and decided I don't want to train with them because I haven't found, I don't want those qualities. And that might be a personal thing. Maybe other students do want those qualities from them, but I don't find admirable qualities or this qualities I don't like that I don't want to adopt. And when I extract myself from that situation, it sets off that emotional abandonment and they start to become nasty. And, and to me, that's always a highlighter that I chose right to walk away from that teacher. Because if a student trains with me and then leaves, it's okay. Like, I understand. I, I feel blessed to have been part of that person's journey. So even a person stays with me a number of years and then leaves, it's okay. As long as they leave on good terms, and they're polite and it's not done in a horrible way, then I'm cool with it, it's fine. Because I don't have abandonment issues, basically, so it doesn't trigger that thing in me. You know, so th there's complications there for a start. And as a student, you have to navigate that well. It's almost like dating, isn't it? Like modern, <laughs> modern dating is very much like we're seeing each other, but we're not officially a couple yet. It's not whatever they say, you know, we're not naming it, we are boyfriend and girlfriend or, or whatever. It's only that with a teacher and a, a student, it's almost like you have to maintain that relationship, but it's not made formal at any given time. And Chinese arts were always about that. And they obviously recognize this going back generations because the formality, the formal acceptance of a student didn't happen at the beginning, right? It wasn't on day one. The formal acceptance of a student was done in front of the rest of the school once people had been there a period of time. And it's maybe a little formal for Western culture, I think I think it's a little formal. I think it's weird when Westerners adopt like old Asian cu customs too much. Like if I'm in Asia, I'll adopt their customs if I'm in their class. But when I'm in the West, I don't pretend I'm a 16th century Chinese monk and I don't bring those kind of things over. Nobody has ever handed me a red envelope and well actually sometimes I have and I told them don't be daft there's no need for that kind of thing giving it back you know but no one's ever given me that and maybe drink tea with them when they sit on a chair and you know they bow they're like I don't do any of that that's not it's not my culture but I understand why it was set up in Asia to formalize the relationship between teacher and student maybe that's better who knows so then once you've made a decision to be with a, a teacher okay I'm going to stay with this one this this is a class I want to learn from and this is who I want to train with then obviously the next challenge is getting close to the teacher. This is the next challenge, isn't it? How to get close to them? Because realistically you do. You don't really want to be, it's a fine balance, right? And you need to get to know who the teacher is. And I'm, somebody might, some people might not like me talking about it like this, but I'm just telling the truth. This is the ugly truth of being in a martial arts class. That it, especially if the class is big, you know, like I got a hundred or so people in a room quite often when I when I teach, and then what I do is I do invite only smaller things for seniors generally. But generally, the majority of the class have about that many people in them. They're normally long term, so I get to know everybody there. But there's people that will hang around at the back in the corner as far away as they possibly can, and they will get it. They will just be at the far end. They're always there, but just at the far end. Already, whether I want to or not, that subconsciously suggests to me. Or rather, if I was that student who was at the back in the corner, I would assume that I would be suggesting subconsciously to that teacher, I'm not that interested in you noticing me. You know, that, that's essentially what you're doing. You're making yourself as invisible as you can in a class to not get noticed. And as a student, that's not wise. Now, the other balance is to constantly be in the teacher's face and constantly keep pushing and clawing at them is the other end of the balance. Uh, other end of the spectrum, sorry, it's an imbalance. And that needy clawing Give, it's also a little bit of a, a pushing away for the teacher as well, or can be, depending on the kind of teacher. If a teacher wants adoration, that's bad. Like a teacher wants adoration, I don't want adoration. I would like to, people to be polite with me, and I'd like them to train really hard when I'm teaching them, but I certainly don't want to be adored by people. I certainly don't want to be worshipped by people, and I don't want to be the master you know that's not what i'm after and i think if a teacher wants that it's very unhealthy so therefore if those people that are constantly pushing and clawing for your attention which you're always going to get in class realistically you're always going to get some of that i understand it those people need something specific from the training but as a student i wouldn't want to be that person because that's a little too in their face you know there's like a there's a fine balance you need to strike 
which is polite, respectful, hardworking, but visible within the class. And as a as a student of these arts who's tried to navigate various lineages, I've been very acutely aware of that. And again, I'm amazed how many people fuck it up. Now with myself, again, as a, a counter to that, I'm also aware that it's very difficult to navigate that. So I try to actually break that and be aware, very aware of the people that stand further back. I'm very aware of the people that are a little bit more invisible because I know there's many reasons for that to do with nervousness or, or whatever, or self-esteem perhaps, or something like that. And and that's all cool, but as a student, if you're going to navigate the teacher-student relationship yourself, then you probably should be aware that that might be. There's something about the way you present yourself that's very important. It's only the same as if you're in a job. If you're invisible in an office or you're very in the boss's face all the time, that's going to give across a certain message. Brown nosing is never an issue. To be honest, if a teacher is succumbs to brown nosing, arse licking, then they're not really very highly developed anyway, and they're not really worth training with. Um, and for me, brown nosing or brown nosing or flirting are always the things that I find a little bit annoying from students because it puts a different kind of dynamic there that's not right. So as someone, some, as soon as someone is very ass licky or brown nosing, which I do understand the difference between being polite and respectful, and that's not the same. And people will be polite and respectful. That's great, but there's a step too far where they're brown nosing, and to me, that is contrived because it's I am pretending to be nice to get something back from you whereas polite and respectful is I'm polite and respectful because that is my nature and that's the way I am and I'd like to manage this relationship well but I don't I'm not expecting something whereas brown nosing is expecting so I tend to find that the people who brown nose or creep around you are also the ones that will get very upset with you and annoyed with you and very pissed off with you very quickly if you don't reward them for their brown nosing so I notice that character trait is unpleasant and the same with flirting, generally from the opposite gender, but not always these days, but generally from the opposite gender, that flirting is also a step beyond friendly that's also a little disrespectful towards that relationship. And I think that that's something that people should be careful of as well, because especially um, some people of both genders will turn flirting into a kind of normal way of communicating. And, and that's that's become their norm. That's how they've learned to communicate with people. But within a class setting, that should not be the dynamic that exists between a teacher and a student. And I think the role of the student is to recognize that that's not right. And the role of the teacher is to obviously not react to such things. So generally, if I'm flirted with, which I'm not under any illusions that I'm a Greek Adonis, definitely not. I don't even think necessary that sometimes when people are flirting with you that they want your sexual attention. I think they're often flirting because they don't know how to communicate with the opposite gender. I think there's complexities there for them. So when that's there, my role as a teacher, and I think all teachers' role, and I talk to, especially the male students, I talk to the male students when they're going to start to teach, if they've been around longer, they start to do that, that it's very, very important that you ignore that and you do not allow the flirting from that student to affect that dynamic bef between you at all. You must become blind to that particular thing. And if it gets too bad, you might have to pull them up and say, look, this is not the way that you communicate with me because it's not appropriate, and, th and then leave it at that. But sometimes, you know, I see people fall foul of that as well. It's a bit of a random splurge there, but just some of the dynamics that exist uh, as a, as a student within a school that's very, very important. I, <laughs> there's another thing as well, you know, like only a personal story. Like I would go into Asia and I would go to a Chinese teacher or a Southeast Asia or something, and a, whether they're a monk in meditation or a martial arts teacher or something like that. Chinese etiquette's very easy. If you want to get on with a Chinese teacher, learn table etiquette around the dinner table. That's the key how to be around the dinner table because there's so much politics that goes on around a, a Chinese dinner table. It's amazing, very fascinating. You have been part of it, but a martial arts dinner or a meditation dinner or a Qigong teacher dinner is very interesting. The order you eat and the way that you say cheers and you toast and all these things are very, very important to the dynamics of a relationship. But I don't want to go into those because I think that if you're going into another culture, you must just learn their culture. And sometimes I would do well with teachers because I made the effort to learn that side of their culture so that I was able to demonstrate manners and respect in a setting that was important to them. And I find in China, the dinner table is a very important one. But then at the same time, there's another really obvious thing is what a teacher wants. Okay, you get unhealthy teachers. Unhealthy teachers want adoration. 
straight away if a teacher wants adoration, they want to be worshipped like a deity. That's a bad sign. What it normally means, the only reason those teachers don't run cults is because they don't have the charisma to draw in enough people. That's essentially what it comes down to. And unfortunately, many teachers fall foul of that. Many Qigong and medita meditation teachers want to be seen as a guru or a god on earth. And, and I see that character trait often, and, and that's not healthy. And if, if your teacher demands that from you, that's not right. You should be careful with that relationship straight away. But so, you know, like, Unhealthy teachers want adoration, but healthy teachers want to spend time with people that they enjoy the company of. It's, that, it's, it's like this basic thing that's not missed. So <laughs> if I wanted to get close to a teacher, I would train hard. I would be respectful, polite, watch my manners, of course, um, train diligently, very, very hard, to, especially if I'm enthusiastic about the method, so that they can see, because all teachers are really enthralled if someone's putting a lot of time into their efforts. Maybe sometimes the effort put in is more important than the talent, you know. So even if you shit at it, just keep going and keep going and pushing. But then at the same time, the teacher is, if they're going to spend a lot of time with you, which they're going to have to, if they're going to teach you seriously, they're going to have to spend a lot of time with you because in the class is not enough. They're going to have to see you in smaller sessions or private. Every teacher has invite-only groups if they're a serious teacher. They just do. Maybe not your Wednesday night community center teacher, but very, not there's anything wrong with that kind of teaching, but very traditional teachers that teach very, very intensely or to a high level, tend to have invite groups for seniors. Or they teach you privately, and if they're going to spend time with you, then they're going to want to enjoy your company in a healthy fashion. I'm not talking anything <laughs> unhealthy, but in order to enjoy your company, you have to be decent enough company to hang around with. So therefore, the people, if I, if I wanted to get close to a teacher when I was a student, I would also make sure that, you know, I had a good sense of humor. I was warm, that I was... You know, sociable and things like this, and and sometimes, you know, you you just have to kind of open up and and make it so that you're actually a pleasure to be around because a, a teacher is still human. So while a teacher may wish to teach you, they still have to spend their time with you, and their time is still precious, especially if they're training all the time. So therefore, I would get on very well with teachers, and actually got very high up in lineages sometimes, just by simply being good company. You know, I would train really hard, of course, but by having a good sense of humor and warm and joke and, and discuss other things, not always make the teacher feel like they were being grilled with questions, but sometimes uh, just the chat or a conversation and lighthearted. So many people fuck up on that. And again, not advice to me. Like, I don't mind. I, I already have a, an understanding with the people I teach, but under, uh, just explaining for people who are going to see teachers that those things are, are wise as well, more important than anything else. A teacher has a life too. And if they're going to give their time and their life up to spend time with people, it has to be worth it. It has to be pleasant. And if the teacher wants something else, which is adoration, woof, then there's a there's a maybe a wound there in their psychology that's not been dealt with. Not been dealt with. I guess probably, you know, before I go on go on to discussing the position of a teacher. Sorry, it's probably unfair of me to continue to say that's not doesn't apply to me without telling you what does apply to me. So I'll tell you what does apply to me. Because if someone wants to... Try, it's a hard one, because if I say this publicly, it sounds like I'm trying to, <laughs> I'm trying to get students or not, which, which I'm not, actually. I'm, I'm literally discussing this just because it's... I guess I just finished teaching a year of full-time martial arts, Qigong, and meditation, really. And, um, you know, they're just thoughts that are going around my head. And I will say that the people I teach, for the most part, I enjoy their company very much, and I enjoy it. Some people are challenging as a part of their personality, but it, that becomes a part of the cultivation for me, because I'm sure my personality is certainly challenging for a lot of people. I know that, so it's only fair. But um, So it's not, not that I'm trying to drop a hint or get more students or none of these things i'm just literally talking about things that have come up you know because i know that that some people within the school that i run try to know how to get closer to me or how to get seen and or how to get taken seriously as a student and and very much like um i think for me what I tend to look for is everything I've said. Like, people must have manners and respect. I don't like bad manners. I don't like entitlement. I mean, it, I've actually been on group dinners and seen a student talk very, very badly to a waiter or waitress. Like, that's always a big target for me. And if someone does that, then I have no interest in teaching them. I also don't really 
have much respect for people that are constantly whining or complaining. I think if sometimes you're sick, you're sick, you know, that, that, that comes up. But and if you're sick, say you're sick. Or if something's not right, say something's not right. But some people are just unhappy with everything, you know, like they're just lost in that mindset of, oh, the weather's too hot and the food's too bad. And in Bali, the traffic's too bad and the air's too bad. And uh, it's painful and I don't like this and I don't like that and I don't like this person and I don't like it just that constant negativity I know that if someone is stuck inside that kind of loop as a kind of habitual pattern it does become difficult for me to want to take that person further it's almost like I rather they tackle that issue first so often I will speak to those people and say look maybe you don't have to be so negative you know or uh, this is assuming it's not based on some psychiatric illness or depressive state or something I, I should distinguish between the two because that is different i'm talking about people that just habitually complain because they're entitled i don't have any interest in spending a lot of time with those people and also people that i don't respect with regards to how they compose themselves so if people are not honorable and have some degree of strength within themselves or um, take personal responsibility or have the ability to apologize when they do something wrong or all of those kind of traits, the things that I would consider decent and normal for an adult human, if people don't have those traits, those tend to be the things for myself personally that cause me to not want to let a student get closer. And what I'll often do is teach them still, but they must correct those things. And I will give them pointers and I will give theory lectures and I'll talk about those things. But if those things are not corrected, I don't want to spend time with that person particularly, and I don't think they're right to be given more in-depth material in the internal arts until they've dealt with those things. Like if you don't have self-responsibility and capability and are not able to be friendly with people and not always be really entitled and wanting stuff, like that kind of those kind of things that turn me off of people, turn me off of taking someone in as a closer student as well. That's just how it works. Now, realistically, if that bothers me, it probably bothers other teachers as well, to be honest. And I think it's often, I guess some people would argue that that's within the remits of the teacher to help with those things. And I would argue that maybe that's true, but maybe those things are dealt with elsewhere in life. Like people have to take responsibility for their life themselves. And by making themselves respectable, generally they demand more respect in life or they get more respect in life, whether they demand it or not. And when you start to get more respect in life from people around you, you tend to get more respect from people that are teaching you as well. It's the same across the board. And I think to pretend that's not the case is always a little bit of an error. I know for a fact that when I would go to see teachers within traditions and I was very intent on getting deeper into the lineage, even with the teacher I'm with now, who's a, who's a remarkable person that I respect very much, massively. But it's, I think as he got to know me, he was also very pleased to know that I had my life in order, that I was capable of being honorable and strong and capable. And all of those things were kind of taken care of. And that also made him more, sort of speaking for him, I think so, getting to know him over, over a few years, made him more happy to take me further. Whereas I had been someone who was very gutless or, or incapable in my life or selfish or using people or backstabbing or talking behind people's backs, all things that are very, very normal in, in amongst modern society. If I'd been very much like that, he wouldn't have taken me deeper into the arts. He just wouldn't have done because... Re the the matter the amount of respect that you have for someone as a human being will dictate how you work with them now i guess some people might not want to hear that because it sounds unfair maybe or unjust because we all come from different places of course but i'm just telling you the ugly truth i'm telling you the ugly truth of the matter that no matter how open or caring a teacher is and how much he may wish to or she may wish to help you out in life if you are someone who is worthy of respect, you're more likely to get respect from that teacher, so therefore they're more likely to take you further. So therefore, as a, as a student, if you're serious about these arts, you have to build yourself into something that is worthy of respect. It's the same as like, you know, the fact is, I'm teaching 100 people in a room. You can't keep everybody happy all the time. It's impossible. You just never will. You never keep everybody happy. Because if you're teaching material, even if it's divided between a few teachers, because there's, there's a number of teachers. It's not just one teacher. So there's a number of teachers. And even if you manage to keep a lot of the room happy and go in the way they will, you'll always get two or three people that grumble, three or four people that grumble, in a group of 100. It's the way it is. And I get that. You know, I just taught this retreat here, and there was a couple of young lads um, 
you know, that's really what they're usually what they are. They're young lads who haven't really in life found themselves. And I remember being that insecure and I remember being that lad and I remember how difficult it is because one of the things that's hard as a young male is to accept self-responsibility. It's just true and maybe not for all but for a lot. And I was that guy, so I remember. I was that negative guy in class. Certainly with my earlier teachers and that was unfair of me but I, I remember it. So those young lads that have never really haven't found themselves yet. One of the hardest things for young males is to accept self-responsibility for anything. So therefore, everything you can't do is somebody else's fault. So there's a lot of grumbling, a lot of me, 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 everyone else's fault, everyone else's fault. It's always young lads. And this is why I always advise that in order for men to grow, they need to develop responsibilities. They need to have weights upon their shoulders. Women, maybe I don't go into what women need so much because I'm not a woman. I don't feel like it's my place particularly, but I understand what it's like to be a young, insecure male. So I always say they need to take on responsibilities. And part of taking on responsibilities, meaning caring for people or having something that you are responsible for, that you must do, and maybe it's the same for women, but you know, I'm only talking for men because I feel I can do that. By taking on those responsibilities, you also develop self-responsibility so that then... If something is not going your way, perhaps it's your fault, or perhaps there's at least something in you you can change. So if the teaching relationship between the student and the teacher is not right, as the student, if I can take self-responsibility, then I will go, ah, there's something in me that I need to change in order to build that relationship better. Because I respect that teacher, or at least there is something that I find admirable enough for me to want to train with him. If I don't, I should leave. So if there's something in that teacher admirable enough to me to want to train with, then I must take on self-responsibility to change something about the way I am so that I can develop that relationship better and get closer to that teacher and learn more. But if, on the other hand, I've never accepted any responsibility, then I won't have self-responsibility. So therefore, if that relationship is not working, it's the teacher's fault. It's the class's fault. It's the other student's fault. It's the material's fault. It's everybody in life's fault apart from my own because I'm not strong enough as a person to accept self-responsibility. Now, one of the greatest things if you accept self-responsibility is all of a sudden you also have self-respect. Once you have self-respect, it'll radiate out of you and other people will respect you. And that's the case, you know, and I learned this because when I was younger, I didn't take on self-responsibility. So if I couldn't get close to the teacher, I remember one really amazing teacher I trained with, I could, he kept, he couldn't see me, do you know what I mean? And obviously what it was actually, and I was training really hard, but actually I had so many dis, just unrespectable traits within me. they just, I wasn't in a good place and I was too childish to accept self-responsibility, so he would ignore me. So consequently, I would moan about him. Oh, he's just, you know, blah, 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 and all the other students, and he only wants respects off that one, and he doesn't respect me because, you know, he's biased. Or, and it was always the teacher's fault. Now, at the same point in my life, because I couldn't accept self-responsibility, I didn't have self-respect. Now, the joke was, because I didn't have self-respect, the teacher didn't respect me. And guess what? Nobody else respected me. So therefore... The peers in the group weren't interested in hanging out with me. Uh, girls weren't attracted to me or wouldn't communicate with me because they didn't respect me. Because once you have self-respect, not self-arrogance, self-respect, there's some kind of subconscious thing that comes off you that means other people respect you, including the opposite sex as well. So many of my social difficulties and complications just came from being awkward male. And the way I dealt with it was I developed some responsibilities. That was how I did it. So I went and worked in a homeless center um, quite intensely as well. It wasn't like I just went a couple of times and handed out some soup or something. I actually helped to establish and set up a new outreach center. But that's me. I can never do anything halfway. I'm always a little bit intense. Next thing I know, I'm getting funding off the local authority and setting up these things. That, I don't know. I take it too far. But I developed responsibilities, and I had people that counted on me. And I started to find more things in my life where... All of a sudden, I wasn't the most important. Other people relied on me. And then I developed that respect. I developed responsibility. I developed respect. Then other people respected me. And then the teacher saw me. Now, again, I'm not saying this to moan. I'm not. I'm quite happy with my life. I'm pointing it out because I think that it might be relevant to some people listening to this. Not necessarily within Lotus Agong, within the school I run, but maybe just out there. Maybe out there. Do you find, as a young male... And if women want to apply it to themselves, fair enough, but I don't understand women's psychology as well as male psychology. As a young male, 
if you're not getting respect from somebody you want to learn from, probably you're not getting respect from other people in your life, and probably not getting respect from the opposite sex or the same sex, whatever your preference. And if you also find that you're also moaning and complaining all the time, which means you start to bitch and mouth off and write things in messages, and, and, and generally what happens is you'll start to try to cause like a ripple of discontent so that people can empathize with how unhappy you are, and you start to moan. And if that is you, maybe this is relevant to you. Maybe this is relevant to you because if you want to go deep into these arts, no teacher, not just, not just me, but no Chinese teacher, no traditional teacher, no high-up teacher, no low-level teacher, no teacher. No teacher is going to want to take you deeper into the system or treat you with more respect if you're not able to be self-responsible, which means you're constantly moaning and bad-mouthing everybody and blaming everyone else for what is wrong in your life. And I would say that that's probably, as abstract as it might sound, maybe that's too abstract. Maybe that's really, really abstract. It doesn't make any sense. But I would say that's probably the most important thing for getting the student-teacher relationship to work for you. If you're a student, I would say so. It's certainly where I fucked up for a really long time when I was younger. And as I got better at managing that, it became much easier for me to get see, taken seriously by teachers. Sorry, I've got the hiccups. Why have I got the hiccups? I don't know. Talking too much. Okay, so, I don't know, prattling on, sharing my thoughts and what have you. But again, I'm not, I'm also not down on people. I'm not down on people that can't manage the student-teacher relationship very well because maybe you are overly invisible, maybe you are very needy, maybe you are very moany and complaining, maybe you are very, what was the others, flirty, maybe you are very manipulative, maybe you are brown, like all those things are no different from each other. They're all based in some kind of imbalance or unhealthy experience you've had or unhealthy relationship you've had. They're learnt behaviors largely. Might have come from your parents, might have come from your first lover, might have come from your teachers. Else, I don't know, like it could come from anywhere, can't it? So I don't blame people. I'm not down on people that have those. And I've also made the majority, not all of those, I've never been a very flirtatious person, but I've, I've made many of the other mistakes my, myself. So I know... I know what it's like, and also I'm not pretending I come from a place of perfection. If anything, I'm just a very deep self-analyst. I'm not a deep thinker, definitely not, but I'm a deep introvert that looks and studies my own behavior and considers it and hopefully changes it for the better, sometimes for the worse, but try to take it in a better direction. So then the other side of the relationship is the teacher to the student. What are your responsibilities as a teacher? Fucking hell, a lot, bloody hell. So, before you do anything else, I think as a teacher, your first job is to make sure the people you teach are safe. That's it. That comes before anything else. Before you try to make people better at their art, before you try to pass on the tradition, you have to make people safe. They have to be safe within your class. Not only feel safe, they have to be safe. And I see so many teachers falling down on that straight away. And I'll give you an example where I fell down on that once. So safe meaning in a martial art class physically. So therefore, you must be careful who pairs up with who. Beginners and clumsy people. And you, you've got to be aware if you're a teacher. If you're in a martial art class, who is the clumsy one? Who's a bit lumpy when they throw their fists? Who's very careful? Who's very skilled? And manage who goes with who very, very well to make sure you don't end up with a very inexperienced, nervous person with a clumsy, wild swinger. Because that's not safe. So you've got to manage that environment well, definitely. So people are paired up well. But then you've also got to make sure that people in your class are safe from predatory behavior. This came up recently because, I don't want to name names, but one teacher that I don't really have a lot of respect for, I'll be honest, I don't think he's a nice person, in my opinion. Other people would disagree, but I don't personally think he's a nice person. Uh, he has, uh, essentially within his closed group, like a smaller group that he taught, a known sex offender who had several counts of sexual assault. I don't really want to go into it, but he was a therapist who sexually assaulted patients once they're on their bed, on his bed, on his massage table. Really gross stuff. Like, just bad. And not once. You know, sometimes you could say once it was a misunderstanding or, or something that's possible, but many, many counts of it. This teacher of internal arts knows this and still took this person into his group and then allowed other people to spend time with that person. And also, from what I've told, then had recommended that person as a therapist for others. And 
okay, that's that teacher's choice to do that because I guess the argument to that is maybe he feels that's not his business to get involved, but he knew the situation of the person. Me personally, if it became apparent that somebody had a string of sexual offenses for assaulting people on their massage table, that person would be out of my school door <laughs> before anything else. Because even if a person has a potential to change or something like that, I'm sure some of you more compassionate people may but argue that, the safety of everybody in that room comes first. So I do not want any sex offenders in my group. And as soon as I found that behavior was there, that person would be out. Because more important than their well-being is everybody else in the school, everybody else in that class. And my role as a teacher is to make sure that nobody of that sort is in that room. So if any of that behavior comes up, I remove the person from the school. And that, to me, should be a given. Now, in that teacher's defense, that person is actually quite an inexperienced teacher, maybe quite an experienced practitioner, but quite new at teaching, only a few years, and only just recently schools expanding. And I think that sometimes when it's new and everything like that, sometimes it can feel like a lot of pressure on you. And you, to go and actually speak to someone and say, well, I'm really sorry, but you're going to have to go because I don't want you in my class. Maybe that's difficult. Maybe that you don't have the confidence to do that. So in that teacher's defense, I think it might be that. You know, someone's brought something to my attention, but fuck, it's really awkward to go and ask someone to leave a class. It is. I've had to throw people out. And it is awkward. It's not a very pleasant experience to upset someone to throw them out. But... You've got to do it. And uh, I think that that teacher particularly, unless he is of the opinion that it's okay for rapists to be in his school and sexual offenders to be in his school, then he needs to grow some balls and go and develop one of the most important skills as a teacher, which is learn when to remove people from his school. And if you can't do that, then you need to have someone who is capable of doing that because otherwise your school is unsafe. And that to me is the bottom line before anything else. The people in my school are safe. If there was ever any predatory guys, they must go. Or predatory women, you know. And I don't want any to be financially abused, physically abused, sexually abused, anything like that. And of course, I had this come up in my school in, you know, professional thing would be not to admit it. Or, or no, not professional, the sensible thing. But, you know, in 20 years of teaching, I had one teacher within the school that actually became, uh, well, actually sexually assaulted some students. And they and this this was unbeknownst to me and this was a teacher and it was always a teacher I thought was a little weird but I didn't really have any evidence of anything and in recent years I've learned to trust my gut instinct but as soon as the girls came and told me then that man was ejected from the school before you know like his his bum skimmed you know like out of the door and gone and made sure that his his shadow would never darken our doorstep ever again and that was my role now I was actually quite I knew that person well, and they'd been around for a, a while, which was bad of me not to have the instinct to know that was going on. But as soon as I was told, that's what's dealt with. But it didn't matter. That person could have been the closest student. That could have been the student that had been with me from the beginning. That could have been my fucking brother. It's not my brother, you know, but they could have been. Like, it doesn't, my brother's not a sex vendor. <laughs> Sorry, brother. But if they could have been. It doesn't matter how close they are. My role is to protect that person. So out they go. Senior or no, they got to go. That was a little rhyme there. Put it on the T-shirt. But that's very, very important. And the first thing a teacher should do is keep everybody safe at all times. Because if you're going to run an internal arts class, you're not going to get total tough guys all the time. There's going to be some quite vulnerable people. There's going to be some people that are coming into this. And whether rightly or wrongly, they are assuming it's a safe enough space to deal with all these issues, and they're very open, and sometimes students are naive. They'll come in and they'll think that everybody else in that room is honorable or admirable just because they're in an internal arts class, or they're honorable and admirable just because they're teaching Qigong or teaching Tai Chi or something. And there's a lot of projection where they will pedestal you, which means they're very open and vulnerable. So the environment must be safe for them not to encounter these kind of predators. So I think that's really major. And I think all teachers should do that First, physical, financial, sexual, psychological abuse can't be there. Second role as a teacher is you must work on yourself. You know, like, I'm far from perfect. I'm a fucking idiot, and, but I'm doing my best, and that, that's all I can do. I'm not going to pretend that I'm some fucking... Well, guru is not a particularly high thing these days. Many of the gurus are muppets, but it's, I'm not going to pretend I'm a, like some state of uh, psychological perfection, but I'm certainly fairly emotional 
fairly emotionally strong, I think that's fair to say, hope so, <laughs> fairly emotionally centered, very fairly emotionally mature. Sometimes I will say things to people that are offensive to them, but it's always very deliberate. It's not reactive. Like, it's not, I won't lose my temper. Sometimes I will say something as a tool to someone, but it's not, I'm not swinging around all over the place with regards to how I feel. And, and, I'm, and as a teacher, I have to constantly be working on that because the more people you teach, the more you're interacting with people, the more complexity there is. So you can't, as a teacher, be prone to these extreme emotions. If I was very depressed, this is not going to be nice for some people to hear. If I was very depressed, very angry, very needy, very hurt, I don't know, any of those kind of things. If I was living in that state, I wouldn't feel right teaching because I know, like I said at the beginning, that there is a transference of my qualities to the people I'm teaching. So I don't want that there. And when I started teaching, I was young, I was still competitive. That was my main thing, competitive and kind of paranoid and angry about like, lots of that kind of stuff, judgmental. Those are the things I had to try to, I'm not going to say grow out of, develop out of, because you don't automatically grow out of those, often they get worse. Develop out of it so that those weren't my default perspective of life, which took a lot of inner searching and a lot of introspection and a lot of practice and a lot of making that my goal. My subconscious goal had to become that. My subconscious goal wasn't, I need to remain the best in the class. My subconscious goal wasn't, I need to be the best at Tai Chi and Qigong. My subconscious goal was, oh fuck, I've got this responsibility of people that I'm teaching all of a sudden and they're looking up to me. Whether rightly or wrongly, there's a degree of projection and they're expecting something from me. So more important than those other things, this first. I must make it so that I'm not a negative, emotional or psychological influence upon those people. And of course, every teacher has bad days, up days, down days, whatever, but that's life. And you have to deal with that so that you can do it in the most positive way. And over the years, I've had lots of practice, lots of teaching, lots of things that have gone on in my life, some easy, some difficult. Oh, okay, here's an example. Right, first day of opening the school in Bali. Don't ever mention this on a podcast. I was driving on a motorbike. Well, scooter in it. We say bikes here in Bali, so it sounds tougher, but they're mopeds. <laughs> <laughs> on these. So driving a scooter to the class, chicken chaser, to open the first, first day it was. Was it the first day? No, no, no. It was the first day of one of the blocks. Okay, so we'd already been open a month. It doesn't matter. I was driving to the class and two bikes hit each other in front of me. Two people hit each other and the bikes exploded and two people were killed right in front of me on the road. It was like five minutes before the class. It's blood everywhere. It was like a mess. and <laughs> It was not pleasant and it was very disgusting and I had bad dreams about that for a while you know it wasn't it wasn't good. it wasn't what I wanted to see in the morning and fucking oh just an awful <laughs> tragedy like just disgusting and I had to help deal with it because basically the debris was all over the road and whatever and I, I don't want to go into it but I was there for a while and dealing with this sort of blood and trauma and then I had to get from there once ambulance police arrived and stuff and I had to go to the class to teach. Now, I walked into there, and I had to then think, look, whatever happened outside the class, I have to teach these people. So what I did was I allowed myself five minutes where I asked one of the seniors to take the warm up. I went downstairs to a private room, took some big breaths, wiped the cold sweat off because it was a little bit traumatic, walked back upstairs, got on the stage and taught a class, and nobody had any idea. And I didn't tell the students, I didn't tell anybody until like two weeks later, three weeks later, when I feel that I got it out of my system. Because it was important to me that as a teacher, what happened outside the class didn't impact what was happening inside the class. Now, that was a very extreme example because that incident actually really upset me because I don't like people dying. I don't like to be there when people are dying and I don't like children dying and I don't like small children's blood and guts all over the road. But as a teacher walking into that class, I didn't feel that it was my role to bring that emotional upset I was feeling into that room. So I turned up, and I must admit, I didn't talk as much as usual. I just did the class. But I didn't want people to see it or feel it. And, and it wasn't because I needed to bottle it up. It's because it wasn't my role as a teacher to bring that into the class. Now, again, a stream example. And then I went and processed it myself. I took myself off in the evening and had some alone time and, and processed it a bit. But that might be extreme, and I'm not expecting every teacher to be able to deal with a very extreme thing and then go in and teach. 
that was my personal choice to do that. I would not have felt wrong to take that lesson off, and I wouldn't judge another teacher for taking that class off because of what happened. But I'm using it as an example of how important it is that you don't carry your emotional swings from your life into the class. So whether your business is going under, you're getting divorced, or you've lost your house, or you've gone bankrupt, or someone cut you up on the road on the way here, or whatever it is, or you had an argument on Facebook, or whatever it is, you should not carry that into the class. And that was always a big thing for me, that when I spent that one to three months with teachers, I wanted to see if they carried their life into the class. And if they carried the negativity of their life into the class, it meant that they weren't emotionally centered enough to be able to be responsible as a teacher. Now, that might sound unfair, but you've got to remember that I'm talking about cultivation arts. If I was going into an office and the manager brought his bad day into the office, all right, whatever. If I'm going to a supermarket and I'm dealing with a cashier and the cashier is having a bad day, I'm understanding it's okay. If I'm going, whatever, it doesn't matter. People have bad days. But hang on, internal arts teachers, cultivation teachers, that is a place where I would expect the teacher to be at a different level of maturity or at least striving to be at a different level of maturity. So when I've walked into classes and the teacher's been there, and I've seen this, I walked into a class, and the teacher will start ranting about a Facebook argument they've had, as if the people in the class care about your Facebook arguments, or the teacher has been ranting about something, like, and they're really upset and very reactive. I don't want to train with that person anymore because I know that their arts are not working for them. They're not centering them. So therefore, your job as a teacher to manage this teacher-student role, number one, safety. Number two, develop yourself so that you are only a positive influence upon the people within the class by the nature of your centeredness and by the nature of who you are, your kindness as well as your strength, your organization, your focus, your humor, your lightheartedness, your discipline, like I probably said that one twice. All of those things, those qualities, are underpinning what you do and they should radiate out. And that is your role as a, as a teacher to do that. Aside from building your skill set, which of course you should, you should always build your skill set. Here's another thing, as a teacher, teaching time and training time are not the same. Because you shouldn't be teaching students what you're doing, you should be teaching students what they need to do, which is normally what you've already done. So therefore, what you teach is not the same as what you do. So therefore, your training and your teaching time are different. So. If I do several hours teaching in a day, I still have to train. That teaching time might be a little bit of training, but not much. And also, I'm not there for me in the class. I'm there for everybody else. When I'm in a class, I am there for them. When I'm training on my own, I'm training for me. So that balance must be right. If you start to mix it, then when you are teaching, you're not there for them anymore. You're there for you. And that's not right. That's an important thing to not get wrong. You must get that balance right. Then as a teacher, the teacher-student relationship must be fair. You must be fair with people in your approach to them. And you must try to get to the stage in your cultivation that there is the underpinning of kindness or love behind what you do. This is very important. It was something I couldn't do for a really long time because then I was a noxious little twat, especially when I was younger, and I couldn't find that. But as I went deeper into my art, especially with the blessed uh, assistance of the people that, that teach me through their great gift, uh, that they've shared with me, like one of the greatest things was a, a kindness or a love for people arose in me, even irritating people, <laughs> even aside from that surface thing, that there is a, a desire to assist people. And as soon as that quality radi radiated out of me, my teaching became better, the results came better, and, and everything functioned a lot better, basically. Uh, I, I was just better at what I did, and I think a better influence on people and a better part of their lives, you know. And as a teacher, that's really important to quote to cultivate or at least keep in mind that that's what you're trying to work towards. Because if your underpinning quality is not kindness, if your underpinning quality is not love, if your underpinning quality is not service, then it's going to be something else. So it's going to be competitiveness or it's going to be anger, it's going to be jealousy, it's going to be su suspicion. Here's some more common ones. It's going to be a need to be desired. It's going to be a need to have power. I've taught people and then worryingly, they've started teaching. I've seen they have a love for power. As soon as I see they have a love for power, I, I can detect it off, and I instantly don't want to take them further because that is an unhealthy trait. Or an, a, a desire to be worshipped. And as I said, many people, if they had enough charisma, would be cult leaders. That's just a fact. They would be uh, 
unhealthy because they would take away and disempower the people you're teaching. Because whilst you must share and sometimes discipline and direct people strongly, and also not allow people to get what they want in class but give them what they need, you also can't disempower them. Everybody's life is their own. Everybody's decision is their own. You cannot take away their power. As soon as you disempower people, create a cult. And you're creating followers rather than students of the arts. Many classes are, consist of followers, meaning that everyone's trying to become a clone of you and they have no power of their own and you're taking that away and that's bad. Whereas the skillful teacher assists people to become at least students, meaning that they are studying the arts with your assistant and not disempowered by you. That's very important. I made that mistake when I was younger, for sure, earlier on in my teaching career, and I see many teachers making that mistake. They are creating followers, not students. Not the same thing. A student-teacher relationship is still based upon respect, is still based upon manners, is still based upon decency, is still based upon all of the right things that are a part of human potential with without there being following, you know? Like, you don't have to... Own, it's, like, some people make the mistake of thinking only followers give you respect. It's not true. Students of the arts can give you respect because they respect what you're sharing with them. Followers are not given you respect. They're disempowered to the point that they feel they need to please you. And that is a very important distinction, so I'll repeat it. Students will give you respect and manners because they want to learn of you, and you give them respect and manners back. Followers will be disempowered, so they feel they need to please you in order to get some kind of um, oh, recognition, some kind of, I've forgotten the word, some kind of comfort from you, some kind of recognition of their value, which is not healthy. Okay, So many teachers make that mistake. If you still require adoration and you still require power, look at yourself as a teacher, that is not the right way to be. You should be helping people to become empowered, stand on their own two feet, skilled, kind, many of those things as well. As a teacher, you must be blind to people's attempt to manipulate you or to, you know, <laughs> uh, sweet talk you or something like that. That is not right. And you also must be aware that as a teacher, you must teach people in the right order. This is also a part of your function and your role as a teacher as well, to make sure that you're, you're taking people systematically through the stages. Another thing that will happen is, is if you teach, and I get this, again, a room full of 100 people, I would say quite confidently, most people in there are happy. Some people are not happy. So you can't keep everybody happy. And some of the ones that are unhappy, are, I would imagine unhappy because they feel they're being kept back. They're being kept back, like they want to do more advanced things, they want to do more advanced things. But the teacher must recognize that it's your job to dictate how quickly the people get material. So if you don't feel they're ready to move on, don't move them on. If they can't get something right, don't, don't move them on. Sometimes you can't keep them there too much, they go insane. But you can't let the students dictate the speed at which you learn. So I get students coming and saying, well, come on, we've been doing this ages, too many repetitions, I want to take this further, why won't you take it further? And I just have, as a teacher, just not bow to that. But at the same time, if somebody gets good enough, I have to give them the next thing they need or the next lesson or the next material because that is a part of, that is a part of what they deserve. If they've done the work and there's no ethical, moral reason not to teach them that thing, then I will share that thing with them, and that's that. You know, that, that's it. People earn the right to learn the next piece of material by being good at the material before. And that's aside from any ethical, moral, moral decisions you've made on their character or anything like that. You can't hold people back, but you can't speed people forward. And I've seen people make that mistake. I've seen teachers make the mistake of holding stuff back because they don't want people to get too good, normally because they're worried about that person leaving or something. And I've also seen teachers give people material too quickly, and you just kind of fuck them up because if they don't have the foundations... They won't get the next skill. And there's nothing wrong with the arts taking a while. Like, they're, they're a slow burner. Like, I've studied these arts for decades. I'm not expecting someone to learn these arts in six months to a year. It's going to take a while of doing that. So they must do the repetition. And that is really important. I've probably been talking for a while now. I could probably do a part two, if you can take it. So I'll wrap this up a little bit by stopping. There's probably many, many more things I can I can talk about. but. I just want to point out many of these dynamics in just kind of a random way. And maybe none of it's helpful, but maybe some of it gives you kind of some of the complexities of the, of the role of a student, the role of a teacher, 
and kind of the complexities of a student-teacher relationship. And, and the fact that students must, in my opinion, if they want to go deep into these arts, study this so that they can uh, navigate their way through a tradition as best as they can. And also teachers should really take some of this on board and look at this, or at least consider these things in themselves, even if they don't agree with me, which is also fine, not everyone has to agree with me. They must look at that and take this on board because being a good teacher is as much of a study as the material you're teaching. Otherwise, you will have a detrimental effect on people's lives. And I think that karmically, spiritually, even morally, humanistically, you have a responsibility to only be a positive experience on people's lives.